out biking, uh, enjoying the weather, using the trail that w worked on last week to get out, enjoy, uh, run the bike down the trail, run it down the river, come back here and talk about cash and receivables with you guys. So with that, let's get started. So <clears throat> uh, cash and receivables, that's what we're uh, dealing with this week. Uh, right now I'll probably cover cash for the time being, take a little break, come back and talk about receivables in a little bit. And that might even get broken into two Two different lectures but in terms of cash so we're going to talk about we're going to talk about basically what is cash and cash equivalents that's how it gets reported on the financial statements in the balance sheet as cash and cash equivalents so we're going to talk about what that is what gets included what doesn't get included in that figure and then we're also going to talk about uh the bank reconciliation that's a critical critical procedure for companies to do. Uh, it's a critical thing for auditors to audit. And I have been dismayed in my practice of accounting, realizing how many times the bank reconciliation is not done correctly. So with that in mind, I'm going to walk through it so that you guys, when you get out, you know how to prepare bank reconciliation. And if nothing else, can at least read one and interpret and figure out whether it's done correctly or not. So that's the goal. And that's what we're going to be covering right now. So uh, in terms of how do we report cash and related items. So cash itself, cash is the most, most liquid asset uh, in terms of dollars is cash. Everything that we report in the financial statements, as we've talked about in the past, get uh, summarized and converted into dollars or into a cash equivalent or a cash equivalency measure when we measure them and report them on the balance sheet. Uh, and on the income statement for that matter. So that is cash. So cash is the base, the benchmark by which everything else seems to get evaluated. Uh, the company needs to have cash in order to continue its operations. That's why we look at liquidity measures and fl financial flexibility measures that we talked about a lot when we talked about uh, how do we analyze and uses of the balance sheet, as well as why do we even have a cash flow statement? So cash is critical uh, when you read, you, when you enter into an uh, economic environment of incredible instability like we have had with the pandemic recently, the amount of cash on hand was a critical measure as investors or creditors were looking at companies and trying to figure out, okay, how long can this company uh, operate in this environment before it runs out of cash and has to declare bankruptcy? And that's been critical. And what you saw a lot in the beginning of the pandemic timeframe was you had movie theaters and airlines and other service industries reporting how much cash they had and how long they could sustain a shutdown. So you had companies like say, uh, Cinemark who said they have enough cash to not have any inflows until November following the initiation of the pandemic, which at the time seemed like a, a immense amount of time or plenty of cash. Uh, in hindsight, maybe that wasn't quite uh, as much as they needed, but that in contrast to another movie theater, AMC, which was cash constrained right from the beginning. Uh, arguably, AMC was not doing well coming into the into the pandemic and the pandemic obviously clobbered them uh, extensively. So <clears throat> cash is very important. It's the medium of exchange in the US and it is a current asset. So examples of cash, this seems somewhat straightforward, but the more you dig into it, the less clear cut what cash actually is matters. So examples, coin, currency, available funds in deposit in a financial institution are considered cash, uh, money orders, some certified checks, cashier's checks, personal checks, bank drafts, savings accounts, all of those items typically count as cash. Now that's cash itself. When you look at a set of financial statements for most public companies, you see both cash and cash equivalents. They're reported on the same line item. And that begs the question, well, if we know what cash is, then what is a cash equivalent? Well, a cash equivalent is short-term, highly liquid investments that are both readily convertible into cash and a, a known amount of cash and so near their maturity that they present insignificant risk of changes in value, which gets to the unknown amount of cash. So that is what a cash equivalent is. Now, that typically means that they're original maturity was less than 90 days. That is how it gets applied. So we can have treasury bills, commercial paper, money market funds. Those can, can all be cash equivalents. However, it's important that they can't be long-term. You can't invest in long-term treasury bills and call it a cash equivalent. No, that's an investment. 
because the treasury bills, ex their maturity extends past those 90 days as 90 days is kind of the benchmark. So things have to convert to cash automatically within 90 days. Now, this caused some problems actually during about the, a uh, little bit before the financial crisis actually, where money market funds got, came under a lot of scrutiny because most companies reported money market funds as a cash equivalent. However, the financial instruments backing up a money market fund sometimes extended beyond a three month maturity, which introduced possible valuation risks. So a lot of companies had to go back and pull a lot of what they are calling cash equivalents, which are these money market funds out of cash and report them actually as uh, kind of short term investments. So that's kind of where things start to get a little squishy. Uh, but that's generally what we would call cash and now cash equivalents. So within this area, we can have restricted cash. Now, keep in mind, one thing to keep in mind, restricted cash is not a cash or cash equivalent on a, from a balance sheet standpoint. And that is because the company does not have the ability to spend it on its operations. Therefore, it doesn't meet the definition, even though technically it is cash from a, I'd say secular definition standpoint, from an accounting definition standpoint, if the cash is restricted, it is not reported as cash and cash equivalents. It's instead reported as restricted cash and restricted cash can be either short-term or a long-term asset, depending on when the restrictions on that cash uh, get lifted and the company can actually start using it again. So there's any number of reasons why a company may restrict its cash or a board or be forced to restrict its cash because of loan covenants. Um, a company may restrict cash for a plant expansion if it's saving or that cash is designated for a specific plant expansion. Retirement of long-term debt. Uh, there are times when the uh, covenants associated with a loan require the company to maintain cash to use for the final eventual payoff of that loan. That would be restricted because it's not available for the company to use in its operations. Instead, it's being held for the payment of a loan. And it can also be cash that is sitting as a compensating balance, for instance, in a bank account or something where the bank requires them to maintain some level of balances in the account just for routine operations. So you see that a lot with some financial services industries where they must have cash, um, some amount of cash sitting in the bank just to clear their transactions. Uh, so that's what we see. Um, as I'll, I'll, I'll put this up, but uh, for instance, if we looked at Tesla's financial statements, so Tesla reports cash and cash equivalents. They also report restricted cash, both current and long term restricted cash. Now, if you were to tie everything out, the cash, re cash and cash equivalents reported on the balance sheet is the cash and cash equivalents reported in a schedule that's reported in their notes to the financial statements that reports cash and cash equivalents. And importantly, that excludes roughly $500 million of restricted cash that Tesla does not have to use in its operations. If you actually looked at Tesla's uh, notes to the financial statements on when they talk about restricted cash, it's, it talks about um, they maintain certain cash balances that are restricted as to withdrawal for their use. The restricted cash is comprised of um, uh, primarily cash and collateral for the sales and lease partners. So that cash is held basically to back up a liability in this case, uh, some of their lease liabilities. So that is how Tesla reports it. And that's why cash and restricted cash, as we see on Tesla's financial statements, is not included in cash and cash equivalents on the balance sheet. However, it is included when we deal with cash on the cash flow statement. So that does, you do put changes in restricted cash through the cash flow statement, which if you followed through Tesla's financial statements, uh, you would see that. And it's actually evident in the note when they say, when the final number of cash, which includes cash and cash equivalents, as well as restricted cash, they say that's the total presented on the consolidated statements of cash flows. So that's basically showing you how they tie that out. Because if you were to look at their statement of cash flows, it wouldn't tie to their balance sheet cash because of restricted cash. So that's restricted cash. There's a couple of other items. We have bank overdrafts. So if a bank writes checks, that exceed the amount that are sitting in uh, in their bank account, that's an overdraft. So that is tech, that is actually a current liability. It's due to the bank. It's not cash. It's actually uh, negative cash, which is actually debt. So um, that is reported as a current liability. They can offset it against other cash, but only if the bank has the right to offset it itself. 
So if let's say you have two accounts at your bank, a checking account and a savings account, and your checking account is overdrawn and the bank has the right to take the money out of your savings account, well then you could, you could offset that in your financial statements as well. If there's no right of offset within the bank, cash has to get, a negative cash has to get reported as a current liability, basically as a due from bank or overdraft, uh, overdrafts. So that's how that gets reported. With that, we are going to move on to the cash reconciliation. So as we walk through cash reconciliation, the idea behind it is we're, it's a schedule explaining differences between the banks and the company's records of cash. So the bank has its record of cash, which is what you see when you get your bank statement every month, or you look at your bank statement, or you look, or log online, that is the record of the cash you have in, in your bank account. That's the bank's record. That is what you're looking at. You're actually looking at their accounting records. You're looking at one of their sub ledgers in their accounts, uh, frankly, their accounts payable. Your bank account is a, is a account payable for the bank. And when you log on and look at your statement, you are looking at a sub account within the bank's accounts payable, what they call it deposits. It's a, a current liability for the bank. So they have their accounting and then you have your accounting, which is the company's accounting in our case. And the company's accounting of what they say the cash balance is needs to be reconciled to what the bank says that the cash balance is in the bank. So reconciling items, there's typically kind of four main items that we look at. We look at deposits in transit. Those are deposits that the company has sent to the bank, but the bank has not received and processed them and applied them to the customer's account yet. Those are deposits in transit. Deposits in transit cause the company's balance, cash balance to be higher than the bank's cash balance for that company. So to reconcile, you would add that amount to the bank's balance. Next, we have outstanding checks. They're like deposits, but the flip side. So the company may have written checks or, or sent money or paid bills that have not cleared the bank yet. So they are either in the mail or they are being processed through the banking system. But regardless, the bank is not aware of those outstanding checks yet or those checks yet. So the company has reduced its cash balance because it wrote the check and sent it out. But the bank has not reduced the amount of cash that it says the company has because the check has not cleared through the bank at this point yet. So we have deposits in transit. We have outstanding checks. Those are by far the two most common air, uh, most common reconciling items. And those are reconciling items to the bank balance because these are things the company has done that the bank is not yet aware of. So the last two items, we have bank charges and credits. These are things that the bank has done that the, that the company does not, uh, is not aware of until they receive the, usually the bank uh, statement at the end of the month. For instance, if the bank pays interest on, uh, in an account or charges the company for something um, or there's other credits or whatever it is, the bank charges or uh, credits, the, credits or debits the customer's account on the bank side, the company doesn't know about this until they receive their bank statement. So those type of adjustments need to be made in the, on the books of the company. So they are reconciling items. They aren't, well, they aren't, they, at the end of the day, they are not reconciling items. They're actually adjustments that the company needs to make uh, to its cash balance. And lastly, we can have bank or depositor errors. That means either the company actually did something wrong or the bank did something wrong, which does not happen often, but it does happen. And depending on where the error occurs is where that adjustment needs to be made or that reconciling area, the reconciliation needs to be performed. So those are the four things that we're gonna have reconciling items for when we reconcile the cash balance for the company and the cash balance for the bank. We're gonna have deposits in transit, outstanding checks, bank changes, or bank, bank charges and other credits, and bank and or company errors. So a lot of these things are caused by time lags. That means there's a, there's a lag in between when the information is available to say the company and when it's made aware of or made available to the bank. So when we have deposits or checks, the bank doesn't become aware of those until after they get basically received and being and processed through the banking system. This, depending on the mechanism and 
where, frankly, where things are being done, just the processing of checks can take three to five days, which is rather long. And yes, it is long. Most of them are actually digitalized now. They used to be hard copy. Literally, the check would flow through the system physically. They're now digitalized for the most part. They are digitalized and run through the system that way, which speeds up the process uh, extensively. So um, these lags and the difference between information the bank has, the different information that the company has, is why we have to do a reconciliation. And that's why you don't expect when you open your bank statement for it to be the exact same amount as what the company is reporting or what it has in its records for the cash balance. So that is why we need to have a reconciliation. Okay, so reconciling items, items that the company recorded, but the bank has not. So we're gonna break out our reconciling items between the stuff the company knows that the bank doesn't, the stuff that the bank knows about that the company didn't at the time anyway, and then we have other items. So as I mentioned, deposits in transit and outstanding checks are items that the company has recorded, but the bank has not. So these are going to be adjustments to the bank balance. The flip side is that there's items the bank has recorded that the company has not, and these need to be adjustments to the company. So these are what we call adjustments to book because you're the books of the company are what are getting adjusted. And that's your bank charges and bank credits. Other items, which are like the bank or depositor errors, they could be on either side. So those aren't one side or the other. It depends on who made the error, whether it was the company in recording it on its books or whether it was the bank in processing it. So what we are gonna do is we're gonna walk through a bank reconciliation. <clears throat> so our illustration here, we have a mining company their books show a cash balance at the, at the Denver National Bank on November 30th in 2017 of $20,502. And the bank statement covering the month of November shows an ending balance of $22,190. An examination of the company's accounting records and November bank statement identified the following reconciling items. So here we go. We start our reconciliation with the balance per bank and the balance per book. So the bank balance, so the statement on the bank balance is $22,190. The, the balance per book is $20,502. So we have our balance per bank and our balance per book. Now, here are the reconciling items because those two balances don't balance right now. We need to reconcile, and reconcile them, which means we need to put the items in that adjust the two balances so that they're the same. So they should be the same, they should reconcile. So first of all, a deposit in the amount of $3,680 that the company mailed on November 30th does not appear on the bank statement. So a deposit the company mailed, it's not recorded yet, that is a deposit in transit. That deposit in transit needs to be an adjustment to the bank balance for $3,680. Next, we have checks written in November but have not uh, charged to the November bank statement. So they're not showing up on the November bank statement. These are outstanding checks. The company wrote the checks. Um, they're outstanding. They represent cash that is that the company does not have, even though they have not been cashed yet. Um, they are uh, payable on demand. So they should be a reduction in cash. So they need to reconcile the bank balance. So these are ch outstanding checks. We reconcile the bank balance. Those checks were uh, one for the amount of $150, one for the amount of $4,820, and one for the amount of $31. So we sum all of those up, and that is the amount of the reconciled item for outstanding checks. Now, third, the company has not yet recorded the $600 of interest collected by the bank on November 20th on bonds held by the bank. So the company is invested in bonds. These bonds are being held by the bank and the bonds are being held by the bank and um, they collected interest on them. So this is just interest that the company needs to record. The bank is correct. The company hadn't recorded it yet. So that is an adjustment to the bank balance for $600. It was a $600 will increase the balance of cash uh, on the books. So that's a reconciling item on the book side. Uh, number four, the bank service charges of $18 are not yet recorded on Nugent's books. So there's a service charge of $18. That means this needs to be a reconciling item 
for the balance per book it needs to come down by $18 for service charges. Um, number five, the bank returned one of Nugent's customers checks for $220 with the bank statement marked NSF, which is not sufficient funds. The bank treated this bad check as a disbursement. So in this case, Nugent had a check they deposited in the bank. However, there were not sufficient funds in the, uh, in the person who wrote the checks account to cover the check. So those checks get returned NSF or insu not sufficient funds, which means they couldn't pay it out. The bank will then take that money out of Nugent's, um, out of the customer's account uh, because it's not money that was actually deposited because the check was a bad check. So that's the, pro that's the process here. So in this case, Nugent had a deposit recorded that it should not have. So it needs to adjust its cash balance down for $220 for that check that was returned NSF. Number six, the company discovered that it incorrectly recorded a check uh, number 7322 that was written in November for $131. That's what they recorded it for. In payment of an accounts payable, they record, oh, sorry, they recorded it as $311 instead of recording it as $131. So there's a transposition error here. So they discovered it incorrectly recorded a check. It was written for $131. Uh, it was actually, they recorded it as $311. So they record it as too much. So they need to actually add the money back into the account of the difference between 311 dollars and $131 will be an add back. And then again, that will be a reconciling item on the book side. So this is a company error in this case. And lastly, the check for the company in the amount of $175 that the bank incorrectly charged um, uh, to this company. So the bank took someone else's check and accidentally applied it to this company's account. So uh, similar names, different companies. In that case, uh, this is a bank error. So um, that needs to be adjusted on the bank side. So when we boil all that down, what we end up with is our bank, our bank reconciliation. So we start with a uh, balance per bank or what's recorded on the bank statement of $22,190 and balance per book of $20,502. Next, we have our deposits in transit, which were $36,680. That needs to get added to the bank balance. Also, we have our outstanding checks. Now that gets deducted from the bank balance. Those outstanding checks, when we summed up the outstanding checks, we got $5,001. That is, needs to be a reduction in the bank balance to get us to what we have recorded in our book balance. Next, we have the interest that was collected by the bank on the bond. That was $600 that gets added to the balance per book. Next, we have the service charge that the bank charged the company for $18. That is a deduction from the book balance of $18. And then we have that returned NSF check for $220, also a deduction in the balance per book. Uh, wrapping up, we have the error that the company made uh, when they transpose the amount. Now that is an addition to the book balance because they record it for they recorded this check for a higher amount than it actually was. So they took too much out of their account for this error. So we need to add back that error. That error is $180. So that is an add back to the book balance. And lastly, there was the error that the bank had where they had incorrectly um, taken uh, a check written by another company out of our bank account. So that is going to get added back to our bank bank statement balance for $175. So when we pull all that together, our reconciled balance for um, our cash, our reconciled cash balance is $21,044. We have reconciled it, which means we have gotten to the point where the bank balance and the and the book balance is the same with the reconciling items in there. That balance is $21,044. That is the reconciled balance. Now, we're not done yet because we have reconciled it, but we now need to actually go back and make our adjustments to our own books. All these adjusting items to our books uh, need to actually be made to our books to give us a cash balance of $21,044. 
The bank adjustments will be made on the bank side, probably in the next month or on the next month's financial or on the next month's statement. We're not as concerned about that. Now, if the bank made an error, we should let the bank know they made an error. But we do need to make an accounting entry to make sure our cash balance is $21,044. So our journal entry to record the, the adjustments required by the bank reconciliation. Our cash balance needs to go up by $542. So we're going to debit cash for $542. We have expenses of $18. So those need to be recorded as expenses for $18. Next, we have accounts receivable for $220. Remember, this is that NSF check that we took out of accounts receivable and now needs to go back in there because that customer now still owes us the money. They gave us a bad check that the check was returned to NSF. They now still owe us the money. We need to put that back in to accounts receivable. We have the accounts payable, which was our transposition error that needs to get um, increased. So we need to credit accounts payable for $180 for that transposition error. We had we earned interest revenue. So we need to credit interest revenue for $600. And that balances out. Once we record that entry, our balance in our cash account will match our reconciliation. That's critical. We can't skip the step of actually making the journal entry or we all we did was reconcile cash, but our books are still wrong. So we need to make that entry. Now our books will be correct and we'll be all set. So um, that wraps up the bank reconciliation. Hopefully that was helpful. Hopefully uh, you now know how to do that and can work through that. Identify which items get recon are reconciled on the book side, which are a bank reconciliation side. And then how do we record the journal entry at the end of the day and the importance of actually doing that. So that wraps up our cash discussion. Next, we'll be moving on to uh, accounts receivable. So with that, I'm gonna go for a quick little ride here. I'll be back and uh, then we'll work through our uh, accounts receivable.